Okay, hello. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming over in the last session uh, for the brave ones. So, uh, my name is Bert. Is it? Hello. Hello. Yes. Yes. Hello. Okay, so my name is Bert. I'm the CEO of ArcFusion. We are a Thai based uh, AI and ML engineering company. We build solutions for enterprises. <coughs> And today we're going to talk a bit about a project we did where we had quite a large workload, not the kind of workloads of uh, OpenAI, but a workload that was too big for uh, the use case to work financially. So we had to find a solution to optimize the, the work, the AI flow. And then we also had a great partnership with Nipah Cloud, and they helped us a lot with the hardware. So uh, Kuntek from Nipah, he will then uh, introduce us to the solutions uh, for uh, OpenStack. Uh, okay. And uh, Kun Koko is uh, my colleague, and he uh, developed the generative AI flow, so he will go in uh, more detail uh, as those uh, pieces appear. So um, <coughs> agenda today, I will explain a bit the case at hand, why, why we would call it uh, somewhat of a scale, and then how we basically solved step-by-step uh, -step in the architecture to try to cut the cost down. So basically, we selected different API services, but eventually we started self-hosting on our own uh, GPU processes, and then we did a few other optimization, which I will go a bit deeper, like monetization and uh, um, and then eventually we got the help uh, from a contact to basically bring it into the stack. Okay, so uh, the case at hand. So our client was basically a software company that built a recruitment system. So it's basically a software that helps uh, HR recruiters to evaluate our resumes, to schedule meetings with the interviewer, to capture the feedback. It's a bit like a CRM, but uh, built for a recruiter. <laughs> now, they're quite big. And they have uh, to manage two, three million resumes, new resumes per month. So one of the things they need to do in the back end, I don't know whether this will be visible enough, but it's basically they transform the unstructured data in a resume, say name, uh, telephone number, first profession, first role, when did you start working. This information, which is a bit blurry, but which is in the CV, and the resume, <laughs> This one is basically translated into a JSON file. So it basically parses out. I'm going to see whether I can get a bit closer. Um, is that because, so, so basically what you would see here, for example, is this person's first job was Cognizant Technology Solutions, Management Consultant, Business Analyst. So they got these kind of resumes in. And that is then basically a JSON file which captured this. So if this one is so blurry, you would then be able to read, for example, here, position, management consultant, business analyst, and basically it captured this from, from here in the CV. So, so once all this uh, data gets, gets structured, the, the, system, uh, the system basically can, can further process this and they will do a lot of analysis on that track. So, Basically, the size of it is, uh, so every month I said there's two million resumes coming in. It goes to an uh, LLM, which basically you ask something like extract the content of this resume and structure it in the JSON file, in the JSON format, and then on the right, that's the output, the two million uh, same resumes. The information of it, <coughs> but then nicely structured so it can be used for further analysis. Now, I just need to, <coughs> to get a bit of an appreciation on the size of this. Um, one resume is typically 2,500 token, right? So that's like uh, three blood pages, right? And then basically the output to JSON file is 1,200 tokens. And typically in LLMs and Gen AI, the cost is driven by the tokens, the tokens you put in, the characters you put in, and the characters that come out. So all in all, this was quite a lot, because if you take 2,500 tokens per resume, you do that times 2 million resumes, that's 5 billion input tokens and 2.4 billion output tokens. As that, that's not exactly the kind of numbers OpenAI is looking at, but nonetheless, this created a substantial cost, and we will go a bit deeper on it. Now, the good thing is as well, it worked. <coughs> this is basically, for a few fields, there are actually 50, 60 fields coming out of there, right? Like skills and, and education, but this for a few fields. And in the first column, you see the existing uh, solution. They had an NLP uh, developed solutions which parsed out their data, so we had a benchmark. And the next one is then basically the LLM based. And you could see, for example, the full name 
where the NLP one had 89% uh, correct, the, the LLM basically extracted 96% correct, so plus 7%. Email a bit better, phone a bit better, but then especially those three fields are actually still relatively structured, a name and especially an email and a phone. But where it really starts outperforming is as the data becomes more unstructured, like first employer, first position, first end year, first start year, it's getting quite unstructured uh, data. And then in the NLP solution, you see, for example, right, like first employer would only be 42% of the times right, like picked out. And if you do an LLM solution, that would go all the way to 83. So, <coughs> so the results look quite promising. Um, the nice thing as well, this is then for different languages. You actually get different, like if you build it in an NLP, well, it would only work for English. Now, the solution we built, you then apply it for a resume as a global company. So our resume is in Spain, in Spanish, and German, and, and Danish. And what you see here is the accuracy, the blue one is the accuracy of first employer. The, the orange one is the accuracy of first position. So and if, if in a foreign language it did it even better than the English NLP one. And, and I said you almost got this for free that there's like no additional development needed, right? So so everybody was quite enthusiastic. But then so now we go a bit more in the details of the problems we ran into and how we solve this. I'll I'll gradually reveal this slide. When we did the dry run, we started realizing, oh my god, this is like a, a lot of data we're pushing through. So I'll try to to track a bit uh, what we learned and Coco will go in the details. So the uh, first one is obviously which LLM to choose, right? That's actually in every, in every uh, project, the first step, what are we going to use, like Llama or ChatGPT? Or, and here we basically learned that the closed one was uh, prohibitively expensive, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so as uh, Bern mentioned before, the, the cost of uh, the LLM depends on the number of tokens, the input tokens and the output tokens. Here we did uh, analysis on uh, proprietary models like Opus, Cloud Opus, ChatGPT uh, 4or, and open source models like Mixro and Llama. Um, for example, like uh, the Cloud Opus, the, the number of uh, input tokens uh, per million uh, like is like uh, fifteen dollars, and the uh, the cost of the output token. Per million is uh, $75. If you take this number and apply to the uh, 5 billion input tokens and uh, 2.4 billion output tokens, you get around uh, 250,000. Um, that's a lot of money for, for uh, an organization. And uh, similarly, if you go down another proprietary model, the ChatGPT4, the cost is a lot lower. Uh, considering these input and output tokens, it would be around 64,000. Um, on the other hand, for uh, Mixo model, open source model, for the Mixo, we did an analysis on uh, Mixo 857B and Mixo 7B. So, um, as you can see here, um, because they are open source and um, the, the cost per input and output tokens are significantly lower than the proprietary models, we got the cost down to uh, four th around 4,500 for the Mixo large and uh, one. 1,500 for uh, uh, resource small. And this also applies to Llama as well, uh, open source model the cost goes out. Okay, thanks a lot, Coco. So, so basically, what we learned is uh, the closed models uh, doesn't, I mean, they work, but they are too expensive. The $250,000 per month, that wouldn't work. And then, of course, like, open source was feasible. It was a few thousand dollars per month and, and processing costs. But then the question was like, are they actually really still working? Is the performance of those open source models good enough? So Coco will walk us uh, through this. Yeah, uh, so the accuracy comparison between open source models, so uh, here we compare the uh, accuracy of the uh, open source models, Mixo large, small, and Llama large and small. Um, the base performing, uh, as you can see here, is the Mixo large. Uh, achieving uh, around 87% of accuracy, followed by uh, Lama 3 large, 82.6%. Um, for the small models, again, Mixo beats uh, Lama 3 um, around uh, 4%. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, so basically that made us decide, okay, we're going to continue with open source. Then the question is, of course, on which architecture we're going to build this. Now, there's basically three main choices which, uh, which you can make, right? 
you do an API call, you, you set up a virtual private uh, cloud, or you do on-premise, right? So the API call to, to evaluate it, those are solutions, for example, like to gather AI or Batrock when, when you would want to stay on, uh, on Amazon. So the evolution, evaluation of it, the cost is quite high because you pay here per token. So the more token you have, it, it scales linearly, right? Um, data governance concerns are actually also quite high. You, you don't know who you're actually working with this to gather AI, right? <laughs> like, like, uh, like how you're going to share your data with that. But maintenance is lowest, so if you start building pilots and stuff like that, it's actually quite easy to work with those API calls. And then you could go to a virtual private cloud, which sits a bit in the middle for all. It's, it's, it can be a bit cheaper at scale. Your data governance concerns are lower. Your maintenance sits somewhat in the middle. And then on the other limit, and that's where we work together, we can also do on-premise and, and basically set up your own uh, hosted uh, solution where you self-host the LLM, which is extremely cheaper, which we will show, which data governance uh, concerns are also substantially lower, but then the maintenance is a bit more difficult, of course. So. Um, so basically, let's start that indeed by the API calls and what the price there is. There we actually saw there was really as well like a massive difference between the different services and, and both in cost as in latency, right? Go cool. Yeah, so for this slide, we did an analysis on uh, three uh, API call services, Amazon Bed, uh, uh, Bedrock, uh, Together AI, and Grok. As you can see here for uh, the Mixel large models, um, the cost in US dollars per month is roughly around four thousand, uh, almost five thousand dollars for together the AI. Um, however, for latency, um, together the AI uh, significantly lower. Uh, it's significantly lower in terms of latency. Um, same goes for uh, Mixo Small, Mixo Seven B. Um, the price is around thousand, thousand two hundred. 1,400 for Together AI. Again, the latency for uh, Together AI is uh, much lower. Um, uh, uh, finally, for Grok, uh, from our analysis, Grok is best in terms of um, latency and uh, the cost compared to the other counterparts. Um, however, uh, at the time of our analysis, Grok, Grok didn't support uh, the mix of small model, and right now it's like the it's limited in terms of the number of calls per minute. The, the difference here, I was actually talking with Randy before <laughs> the session on, on, uh, on those type of services and you mentioned Grok. Now, the difference is actually quite spectacular, right? If you say, for example, you compare Grok with Together AI and you would have a, a service like for those two million resumes, Together AI would charge you $4.7 thousand dollar per month and Grok only 1.7, right? And the latency of Together AI would be two times as big. So it is actually quite fascinating how much difference there is between uh, between those services. So if you want to build it on the API, I would say uh, choose it wisely. Um, and then basically, you can also uh, self-host, right? Especially with open source, you, you can basically spin up something and, and, and run. The weights are open, right? So you can run it uh, fully yourself. So we, we started running some experiments with that, uh, both on cloud as on uh, on the Nipa uh, solutions than on the Nipa cloud. So let's let's first go to a few. Um, right. Um, so for self-hosting, there are three main factors to consider. Um, first one is uh, GPU memory. Um, so uh, the memory depends on uh, the size of the models, or in other words, the parameters. Right. The second consideration is the compute power. Um, if you buy a GPU, there will be uh, something called um, uh, T flops, right, or uh, trillion floating point per second. Um, the higher the number, the faster the calculation is, and it leads to lower latency. Finally, the sorry. finally the memory bandwidth. So, um, because when you run LM, it requires some magic uh, computations, and uh, those computations will be passed around the GPU. So, the higher the bandwidth, the faster you can transfer the data within the GPU. Now, for self-hosting, um, to select uh, how to select the GPU memory, we we, we can uh, see we can compute uh, theoretically how large um, the memory we need. Um, so, for example, in uh, Mixo Small, it has seven billion parameters. If you plug that into the 
to the above formula. So it would be 7 times 4 bytes divided by 32 divided by uh, the uh, precision of the model by default is 16. So if you plug those numbers, you get, uh, and, and, sorry, and then you uh, multiply by 20% for the GPU overhead. So if you apply the calculation, you get around 16.8 um, gigabyte of RAM. So to, that means that to run pixel small, 7B, you need around 16.8 gigabyte of RAM. Uh, um, same goes for the pixel large. Uh, it has 46.7 billion parameters. Apply to the same formula, you get around uh, 112 gigabyte of RAM. Now, here we experimented on uh, two NVIDIA GPU cards. Um, the consumer one, uh, A100, A10, and then the uh, workspace one, uh, workstation one, A100. Um, these two models has uh, different specs. Um, the A100 like has not 80 gigabyte of RAM, um, uh, higher uh, float, higher flops and higher bandwidth. Of course, if uh, if you uh, if you launch this in your VPC, it would be it would cost you around 3,700 uh, compared to the other one, which cost you only uh, 700. Now, if you uh, buy these two cards, uh, you can only pay it one time, and uh, the NVIDIA A100 is like 10 times more expensive than uh, A100, A10, A sorry. And um, for the latency, um, because it has higher flops, higher, because uh, NVIDIA A100 has higher flops, higher bandwidth, um, the latency is uh, two times more. And then, like, once we, uh, we got that far, we, we, we figured out there is actually still a lot of optimization to do. And then um, we, we just want to touch on two with that quantization, which, which uh, de decreased a lot the need for hardware. And, and we had uh, some novel configurations we used for uh, the LLM itself. Uh, right, so for the first technique that we apply is the quantization. So the idea behind uh, quantization is that um, it, com it compresses the uh, model weights from higher precision to lower precision. For example, from uh, 14 point 16 to uh, 4 bit. Um, so this substantially reduces hardware requirements and at a cost of that, it comes with a loss in accuracy. Yeah, and the, uh, the loss can be very large depending on the model. So, um, here we, ha we experimented on uh, Mixel Small, uh, the full model, floating point 16, and Mixel Small quantized 4-bit uh, model. Um, again, you can apply the previous formula and apply the uh, weights there, but the denominator would be 32 divided by only 4-bit uh, for the quantized model. So it comes down to 4.2 gigabyte uh, of RAM. Um, so this is around uh, four times smaller than uh, the, uh, the, the the full position model. There are a lot of like uh, quantization algorithms. We experimented with three of them: uh, GPT, GPTQ, AWQ, and BNB. And uh, from the chart here, we can see that GPTQ uh, works uh, the best and it's like 5% off compared to the full position model at 80.6%. Now, again, this slide summarizes what I just discussed. So um, we experimented on uh, two cards, A10 and A4000. Both are consumer-graded uh, GPU cards with different memory and uh, different price and latency. Uh, we can see that the, the the quantized model um, costs you around like uh, 1,000 US dollars uh, cheaper and it runs much faster. But at a cost of that, we uh, incur 5% point accuracy loss. Another technique that we apply is uh, called speculative decoding. So the idea behind speculative decoding is that instead of having uh, 
uh, just one big model to predict the next token that the LM generates. We have one big model and small model. So this, the, the idea is that um, in normal English language, right, so there are some words, some terms that are really easy to predict, like A and uh, So it's very common as well. And uh, for these kind of words, you don't need the capability of the large model. You can uh, use the smaller model uh, to, to predict those words instead. So um, what we can see is that uh, with speculative decoding, we uh, we were able to reduce the latency by uh, 50% and we incur no, we didn't have any loss in inaccuracy. Um, yeah, as you can see here, um, the with speculative decoding, the latency goes down, goes down uh, two times. Good, so, so let me summarize this uh, part before I get to contact, but basically we, we try to optimize for cost latency and accuracy here. The, 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 I have to say the deviations between them is quite big, right? If you see at the cost, the cheapest we had is basically a cart of $850. One of the most expensive solution is $250,000 per month. If we look at latency, the fastest was three seconds with rock, the, the slowest is 25 seconds. If we looked at accuracy by quantizing, the best one was 76%, the worst 43 So those are really, if you think about it, big gaps <laughs> by, by and, and the number of, of kind of specialism we will need kind of as a, as a community, all the way from configuring your LLM to configuring your GPU to make this better. It's actually a big challenge coming our way. And yesterday I heard somebody saying we need another trillion dollar infrastructure to get the whole Gen AI running globally. I think that could be true, but then indeed like optimizing that trillion dollar, there is a lot of potential value that uh, can roll out there. And, and for today, and it, I just wanted to show a case to kind of prove the evidence as the, the difference in uh, performance and cost is actually really massive if you work uh, a bit on it. So I'm gonna get it to you, contact, thanks so much. Thank you. Hello, hi everyone. So uh, right now I'm going to talk about OpenStack. <coughs> so uh, you uh, may or may not uh, use the GPU on OpenStack. Uh, today I'm going to uh, tell you a quick understand how uh, PCI Path 2 work with the GPU. Yeah, so you, you can uh, do by yourself uh, step by step. <coughs> so uh, basically, uh, when you use when you want to use the GPU deployment on OpenStack, there are two options. The first is a uh, vGPU, like an uh, NVIDIA vGPU. You need to uh, pay the license for NVIDIA, but it's uh, a lot of expensive, and you you need to deal with the the share of the memory <coughs> of the vGPU, right? So uh, the the option uh, that that Deepa uses uh, just a PCI Pass two. The concept of PCI Pass 2 is to uh, pass the uh, PCI from the hypervisor or computer uh, directly to the VM. <coughs> so in this picture, uh, let's say the computer would have the NVIDIA and NVIDIA GPU and uh, AMD GPU, right? So we need to configure the OpenStack NOVA to pass the PCI uh, card uh, from the hypervisor to the VM. And we need to install the driver of the GPU uh, inside the VM, not 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 at the hypervisor. So, yeah. <coughs> so uh, the first step, uh, we need to change the the driver of the hypervisor from uh, at the beginning uh, when you uh, uh, install the NVIDIA card, right? The driver is automatic install, uh, like a AMD GPU or NVIDIA GPU at the hypervisor. The first step, you need to uh, block the the hypervisor load the the NVIDIA GPU. <coughs> so you need to find the PCI slot in the hypervisor by this command. Just ls PCI select NVN and grab NVIDIA. Uh, you uh, you will find the two device. Yeah. Uh, this is the consumer card. Uh, you may find two device. The first one is the the display uh, VGA controller, and second one is a audio driver. So <coughs> you need to select the display, uh, the VGA controller to the OpenStack, right? So you need to copy this number. Uh, the first section is the vendor, the, the vendor NVIDIA. Yeah. 
the second <coughs> section is a model. Okay, and uh, when uh, and and the uh, eight one o o is is the uh, PCI ID. When you uh, uh, type the command LS PCI, uh, you will see the driver is load on this PCI. You will see the NVIDIA driver is is loaded in this computer. So this is not correct. We can use this one. So we need to block the NVIDIA driver load on the the hypervisor. Okay. <coughs> Uh, first of all, we need to change the driver load from NVIDIA to VFIO PCI. Okay, so <coughs> we just the enable VFIO PCI in the kernel module and uh, just config VFIO PCI to load this uh, this um, PCI ID here. <coughs> just just copy uh, ID in the this file. After that. Uh, <coughs> You need to uh, backlist the the NVIDIA driver should not uh, be load on the hypervisor by uh, edit this file and type the backlist here. Yeah. And for the KVM, you need to enable this uh, option. Yes, yeah. in document say, but I'm not sure why. Yeah, and after that reboot. So when <coughs> the computer uh, reboot already reboot, you just check the the driver. Uh, should be load the VFIO PCI in this card, okay? So, uh, if VFIO PCI uh, is already load in this card, it should be okay for for the PCI pass through. <coughs> After that, uh, in the Nova, so Nova is work with the PCI pass through. Uh, Nova have uh, three component that you need to configure. Uh, the first one is a uh, Nova scheduler, Nova API, and Nova compute. <coughs> the first one is a uh, Nova scheduler uh, because uh, in, in terms of the Nova scheduler, uh, uh, Nova will uh, gathering all of the information uh, on the compute node, all of the compute node, right? And uh, filter the device. So <coughs> uh, in the default, uh, the PCI pass to filter is not enabled in the default configuration. You need to uh, enable it by do this. And let's start the Nova scheduler. <coughs> okay, for the Nova Nova compute, uh, basically Nova compute is uh, installed in, in inside the hypervisor, right? To to control the KVM delivered in the hypervisor. You need to tell uh, which PCI uh, is installed in the compute node by uh, add uh, pass to wireless here. Just and let's start the Nova compute. <coughs> Okay, for 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 the Nova API, uh, right now uh, you will config the scheduler right, and uh, Nova compute. So the Nova database is already know the PCI. But uh, when you want to launch an instance, you cannot uh, specify the, the the ID PCI ID right. It is hard to do that. You launch instance by the flavor. So you need to map the ID PCI ID to the flavor by uh, Nova API. <coughs> So you need to map the the PCI uh, alias uh, ID to the name. Uh, let's say uh, this one, this ID is a uh, NVIDIA A four thousand. Uh, just any name you can put here. Yeah, but remember. <laughs> okay, and list the Nova API. After that, uh, when you create a flavor, you need to use that name into the metadata in this flavor. Uh, the the first section is a. Uh, Name and second reason is uh, how many GPU on it on this flavor. Let's say if you want to launch the instance with two GPU on this uh, GPU model, just change to two. Yeah, that's it. And after that, just launch a VM and uh, install the driver like this. Uh, just uh, APT install NVIDIA driver. After that, you will <coughs> see the NVIDIA driver is already loaded inside the VM. Just simple, right? Let's try. <laughs> yeah, thank you.